Hello Avatar fans and welcome to the next episode of the Avatar Online podcast. This is going to be episode 260 of our regular shows and we're recording this one on uh, June 3rd, 2023. This is the official podcast for the fan site AvatarTheLastAirbenderOnline.com and I'm going to be your main host, Morgan Airspeed Prime. Joining me on the podcast is Greg, greg to b from the site. What's up everyone? Excellent. So uh, we have more of a kind of typical show this time out where we do have a couple of news topics. But for the most part, we will be getting back to our rewatches of both Avatar and Korra. We'll be doing two Korra episodes. Uh, They are K205 Peacekeepers and K206 The Sting. And our Avatar episode for this time out is going to be 203 Return to Omashu. But we will start with the news. So uh, the first piece of news, I I guess, is just this. um, I think we've discussed this before, but the uh, Azula comic, Azula in the Spirit Temple, has been delayed again. And we actually have to cover the fact that I think since the last podcast, it has been actually delayed three separate times. So it has had three separate release dates in between the last time we recorded and now. So pretty much, I think, all but one week in May, this book received a one week delay. So it went from basically being kind of like mid-October to now releasing October 31st uh, mass market and November 1st uh, in comic book stores. That's the current release date. And we don't know if that's fully locked in because who's to say it doesn't get delayed uh, at some point this month. Um, It's a very frustrating situation. None of these delays are huge, but it's now at the point where it's gone from being a... Uh, early er, they they told us summer release to it actually got a release date and it's end of September now it's basically November it's actually coming out so it's in a little bit of free fall here I hope this is the end of the delays and that it can just like hit this delay and just come out because I think it would be a disaster if this uh, fell into 2024 especially given that we still haven't had the announcement of the Mako comic yet. Um, People are getting frustrated with what's happening here. But uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on the Azula comic, the most hyped comic of the year, uh, continuously being delayed over the last few weeks? Yeah, that's that's quite unfortunate. And yeah, it definitely feels like a lot of people are, you know, just a bit upset since this, you know, is obviously a popular character and people are really looking forward to it and you know it might even if we know it's not going to be like sort of the the full resolution of this character's arc or anything you know we're sort of thinking it's going to be the the lead into that maybe so it's it's quite you know you know too bad that it's getting pushed as far back and it doesn't seem like we're getting you know any particular reasons on why it's being pushed back if it's trying to like schedule it with something else or if there's some other conflicts because as far as we know it's you know pretty much there and ready to go so clearly there's something we're just not privy to yet yeah because this creative team has always been as far as we're aware like very on time like we've never heard about production delays with faith there and hicks and peter wartman most of the delays that have happened to books the last few years have been then to like kind of COVID shipping stuff, distributor kind of stuff. And I assume mm. that is the case here. If they're specifically choosing to push it back, this certainly pushes it like after New York Comic Con. But that seems an odd kind of thing to just specifically choose to time it afterwards. Whereas I, if you, I assume if you could you would want to be able to sell the book at one of those conventions, if not both of them. Uh, But now they have missed that. Um, I don't really know what the, uh, the issue is. Like, obviously it means Dark Horse, I suppose, get both those conventions to maybe announce some stuff, but I don't think we're expecting like a follow up book to this because it was always just a one shot. Um, And if there is another ATLA comic come coming, it will be about a different character, we assume. So, I don't know. It's it's hard to speculate here, um, because it just keeps randomly happening. It'd be un- it'd be a bit more understandable if it was like every month it got a slightly different date, which has happened to books before. But uh, it's very weird that just three weeks in a row it just had different dates. Um, uh, it it does mean Dark Horse's lineup is not looking good this year, where like the free comic just kind of came and went. I have literally seen no one else talk about it. We did our podcast review on it. Uh, I did a video on it, and I literally have seen no one else talk about it. Uh, I don't know if that's your experience with the free comic, but uh, it's definitely mine. 
Yeah. Yeah, so th- th- that's a really unfortunate thing. The Chibi comic, basically the same situation. Um, it's very forgettable. Um, but interestingly, all their other books, the um, kind of reprint stuff, seems to stick to its release dates. And this has always been the frustrating thing with the Dark Horse comics, is that it's only ever the um, new content books that actually get delayed. Um, then you add on the fact that like Beast of the Four Nations, still MIA, and there's the the continuous frustration since Avatar Studios was announced with Dark Horse. Um, I'd never jump to like we need to switch publisher because I, I think we're probably with the best publisher for like a, a licensed uh, comic. Uh, I feel Avatar could get lost if like Marvel or DC took it and then IDW seems kind of unstable at the moment. So I, I, we are in the right position, but I would like them to explain what the, the problems are, but um, we'll probably never know. Uh, hopefully it just comes out this year. Uh, we'll move into a bit of merchandise news here. So we got the, at last, this has been something that we've been waiting basically two years for, the Toph uh, Gallery Diorama from uh, Diamond Select Toys has finally been announced. Uh, they they said basically two years ago that there would be multiple other Avatar Gallery Dioramas. We finally have the Toph revealed. And uh, yeah, probably one of the most hyped uh, merch announcements of the year. It's a really nicely done uh, Toph. Again, the crazy elemental bases here are the kind of standouts and Toph has a really cool Earth one here. Uh, I'd maybe question slightly the pose that Toph is in because uh, you don't typically see Toph do those kicks and the idea of like her taking her foot off the ground to do a big attack isn't typically her style. But it's a very nice sculpted Toph, and uh, again, the base looks uh, fantastic. And for the price it is, it just feels like these are the best kind of uh, bang for your book kind of uh, figures, statues out there. But what are your uh, thoughts on the Toph gallery diorama? Yeah, no, I I really like this one. I think, like you're saying, like the the rock effects and everything on this one, even if the pose isn't, you know, super iconic towards what we might think of Toph. I mean, it definitely has like, you know, all of the energy towards it and whatnot so no i think you know for for these ones i think the dioramas always feel really cool from these ones at least from what we've seen so far i think for most of them you know the dioramas are pretty cool so this one definitely looks like it's going to be worth it if you're into it mm-hmm. you know obviously we 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 pretty much knew it was probably going to be tough we we look forward to like who's next will they do the first non-bender one and do um Sokka? Mm. Um, will they switch over to the next like obvious bender in line, which is probably Azula or Iro? Um, I think any of them would work. Um, you should probably fill out Team Avatar first, though. But um, again, we seem to know that there's a, probably at least one or two more coming, so there'll be time to, to uh, see them. Uh, next piece of merchandise is, again, a finally, uh, I think also a pretty similar amount of time between the last kind of reveals, uh, Boomy Funko Pop has been uh, revealed officially, and I think it should be coming out soon. Uh, this is a Entertainment Earth exclusive, at least in the US and Canada, I believe. Uh, it doesn't seem to ship anywhere else. Uh, I'm not sure if it's been revealed, uh, how the rest of the world is going to get this one, but officially revealed we have pictures of it it looks really really good it's uh kind of boomy from the basically the fight against ang so it's kind of like shirtless boomy but uh, all the details are here because boomy's so old uh, i like the paint detailing and how they made him look old and all the rings and stuff like that i think it's uh one of the nicer looking funko pops and i definitely would like to get the boomy if i can without paying too much but um what are your thoughts on the boomy funko pop yeah, I think this one works pretty well. I think even if he's shirtless, it feels like he has a lot of detail on him, so it's a lot, you know, to sort of look at and whatnot. So no, I think this one is definitely from ones I've seen, you know, a lot of them, this one feels like it's pretty cool and you know, this is a pretty popular character, so that's always good to get one of those. And I, I do hope it goes more widely available, but usually after a while they do sort of lose their exclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And this should hopefully be the start of a new wave of Avatar Funko Pops coming out. There there was a a wave rumored like last year that just doesn't that just seems to have disappeared. There was another one rumored earlier on in the year, uh, including like, you know, Samurai and uh, Samurai Ronin, you know, Momo and Appa, that whole scene and a couple of other ones. And so 
hopefully this the exclusives usually are the ones that get sort of quote unquote leaked out first just as a one off and um, so uh, hopefully we get to see more of that stuff um but uh, the final piece of news is probably the biggest one here and it just happened uh, yesterday uh, or the day before uh, that is that uh, Netflix have officially announced that we will get our first look or I suppose it's technically we'll get our first news officially about uh, Netflix uh, live action Avatar. They have an event coming up on the 17th of June called uh, Netflix uh, Tudum. Tudum. I- I'm not sure about the, what the pronunciation or the idea is there. But uh, apparently it's going to be in streamed live from Brazil. I think the specifics are that they have most of the main cast um, that are going to sort of present the reveal here. uh, And it's going to effectively be our first look at Netflix uh, Avatar. We don't really know what to expect in terms of like, will it just be some uh, poster, character posters? Will it be like a teaser trailer? Will it be a full trailer? Um, the The information on the show has been a little all over the place, but now we have concrete information this is when we are going to get it. So about time, but uh, what are your thoughts on the announcement of the announcement? <laughs> yeah, announcement, announcement. That's funny. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's good that we're finally getting some, you know, concrete information on it. And I'm sure, you know, I've seen, you know, plenty of places, you know, reposted and talk about it at this point. So it's definitely getting out there that this is, you know, where they're finally going to be talking about it. And if they do have the people there, then maybe that makes me think that it might be sort of a bigger reveal rather than just sort of like a small sort of like, you know, teaser or poster, like you were saying. So hopefully it's something that, you know, can really be i guess sort of speak on um just to sort of you know get a feel for how it is going to be and you know i'm guessing if they're ready to show it off in any sort of real capacity then maybe it will get more of a you know an actual date when it's coming out and stuff like that but we'll have to wait and see yeah obviously we want a first look we want some sort of a release date uh, after all this time waiting uh again it's it's interesting uh <laughs> The 2025 movie had an image before this uh, show had an image. That's always going to be a funny thing. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if this is necessarily going to be the big make or break thing because I think visually I'm expecting it to look fine because I think the last Airbender movie got the look in live action correct. And if they lean maybe slightly more um, show accurate than that, maybe a little bit more colorful, um, that's probably the perfect uh, look to have um, I've I've no real worries on that kind of visual department it's more on mm. the script the dialogue is obviously the big thing from the last airbender movie that de- definitely needs to have the biggest upgrade and then just sort of how the adaptation actually is in terms of uh, how they choose to insert episodes where do the transition between episodes uh, cut content additional content that's going to be make or break because that's where the last airbender movie really suffered in that they had to cut out everything including suki kiyoshi warriors and in the end it covered like what six seven episodes maybe that movie touched on one or two other ones whereas it looks like based on the casting they're hitting on everything except maybe the great divide and jong jong i don't think we've heard about a casting information for jong jong so everything else otherwise seems to be in here and they look like they have the time to do it. It's just eight episodes to adapt 20 episodes, even though it's eight hour long episodes. How, how specifically do you do the breakdown? And um, again, mm-hmm. I, I don't think we'll get too much of a sense of that from the reveal. I am expecting more of just a, a first look, maybe a, a little bit of dialogue, but um, anything is a positive at this point. We just need to finally get going and actually see what. Uh, happening here so um not too long to go there uh not two weeks away basically um so uh we will report on this uh when uh it actually happens um but uh yeah that's basically been all of the news um in terms of expected news i suppose coming up uh we're probably a couple of weeks away from finding out about uh what is going to be happening at san diego comic-con usually towards the end of june uh we'll find out like if there is going to be an avatar panel who's going to be at that panel and there's definitely some expectations this year because there's a few weird things going on where i don't believe braving the elements podcast has been fully confirmed for a third season just yet 
I think they expect to get it, but it actually hasn't happened yet because I'm pretty sure for the last couple of months they've just been putting up like repeats on the feed uh, if you're subscribed to that podcast and that would be typically what they do as the podcast so will it just be a publishing panel this year will they use that to sort of announce the return of braving the elements and then of course will Mike and Brian be there is going to be the kind of the telling thing so um I suppose just as a brief bit of speculation, um, what are your thoughts about uh, San Diego Comic Con? Do you do you think there'll be anything here, or is it still too early? I don't know. I'm getting the feeling that it's like probably still too early for most things. I mean, it would be cool just for them to bring back the podcast because it seems like a lot of people enjoy it and it seems to be like a fun thing to have at the con, um, even if it isn't like you know the most newsworthy type thing. But um, I would hope that they would have at least something that relates to Avatar Dare, even if it is just sort of promoting stuff that we do know is coming or is coming soon. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know. It feels kind of quiet right now. So that's, you know, I don't know how you can take that. Uh, yeah, at the very least, I would expect them to show off like the cover and properly announce the uh, Mako comic because it, it would technically be a year since we first found out about that comic like existing because what was it at, at San Diego last year? They announced that there's a Korra comic trilogy in the works, but then at New York Comic Con they confirmed like, okay, the first one is Mako, like Alexandria Monique is going to be the artist, um, that sort of stuff. The but it's been basically a year. I, I think it's about time they pretty much have to make that announcement. It'd be a bit weird if they didn't. Um, the timing is going to be like basically right at the same time as uh, Legacy of Yang Chen releases so there'd be maybe some expectations about like are they going to immediately announce like what the the next kind of Chronicles of the Avatar stuff is as well because it, it, the expectation would be a new Avatar because they've both both been kind of duologies so uh, will they make that announcement immediately or not but um, that's uh, where we're at with that so yeah, that's uh, the news, and we'll move straight into our rewatches. So we're going to start with Korra episodes for this one and end with our Avatar episode. So our first episode today is uh, K205 Peacekeepers. We're obviously still in the early stages. We're getting towards the middle of book two spirits of Korra here. And uh, for me, Peacekeepers is an interesting episode because... Um, I think these two that we're covering today are probably the two weakest of book two uh, and in a way two of the weakest of the series. I still think they're very very solid episodes I just think most of the rest of Korra is better than them basically except remembrances and um, Peacekeepers I tend to rate a little lower than the Sting uh, just because I think it exemplifies a lot of the kind of bad parts of writing that I don't particularly like, because it's very drama heavy on the the Korra Mako side of things. But <laughs> I think it's more of a tag team thing where just these two episodes in general happen to be where some of the more frustrating plot elements in book two happen. Otherwise, like I still think there's a lot of good stuff that's happening here. Like I like the kind of build up of Varric into the kind of villain position and the the actual sort of complicated plotting that we have going on here um, and, you know, Korra struggling with, you know, trying to convince world leaders is an interesting plot, even if they kind of, I think, maybe overdo it with Korra in this episode. Um, but, um, you know, just for one of the weaker episodes, I still think there's some substance to it. But um, what are your general thoughts on Peacekeepers? Yeah, no, I definitely get that that sort of vibe as well from these episodes because it definitely seems like there's uh there's just a lot of back and forth and a lot of dialogue here and you know it's really sort of setting up things that's going to happen towards the sort of you know later half of the season overall. So these ones are sort of you know I guess sort of middling about, but they do have you know a couple different things that are going on that make it sort of interesting. The whole idea of you know Varric and things that are happening behind the scenes, getting to sort of learn I guess a little bit more about. Mako and sort of what he set to done and him sort of getting back into the flow of things. So I don't know. I do like the idea of just getting them all back into, you know, Republic City since that is, you know, one of the, you know, highlights of the show overall, just having the city here. So it's always cool to see them interact with the city and sort of a particularly sort of like a, a different way than we're sort of used to them seeing them do. So I think there is, you know, a good bit in here that you can sort of latch on into, even if they're not generally considered uh, the strongest episodes of the show overall. 
Mm. Yeah, and obviously, like, a lot of the rest of the fandom have, like, opinions on these, like, that these episodes probably should have been, like, <clears throat> completely changed and, like, just cut the Mako plot, cut the Bolin plot, the Sami stuff, but my my point on that is always that, like, if you don't do that, then, like, those characters are basically just, like, not involved in the book, like, at all. Um, and I actually appreciate, ultimately, where we get to with the Mako plot, ultimately where we get to with the Bolin plot. Sami, unfortunately... They, this is a book where she's not really up to much, and we'll get to that more, I think, in episode six uh, when we when we discuss that in, in a little bit. Um, but uh, it it you, you need to use the characters definitely. But we'll we'll get into it here more specifically. So um, we obviously are in, in Republic City. Uh, Cora of of course has come back because she needs to get the support of the United Republic military to assist with what's going on down the south. So there's going to be a, a Southern Water Tribe peace march in the city. Uh, and this is where we begin to get some of the kind of conflict between Mako and Korra, where Mako suggests that Korra should perhaps be a little bit more neutral in this situation rather than directly announcing that she's going to basically lead the peace march effectively. Uh, and he just kind of notes that you should think about your neutrality. But obviously Korra's opinion on this is that well, she isn't neutral in this because she was there kind of as this kicked off and she knows that like Unalak is the villain and has orchestrated this to a certain degree. And then uh, we as the audience will eventually learn the other half of it has also been orchestrated by Varric. So um, you, you realize that it's just like no one could have seen the whole complicated situation playing out this way. Um, so uh, that that's the kind of core setup at the start here is just the peace march in Republic City so that the the politics of like you think it's specifically the water tribes but because there's a lot of water tribe people in Republic City it's uh, playing a role in our kind of central city as well uh, but what are your thoughts on this kind of opening scene here to start the episode? Yeah I mean I think you know there's a lot to sort of you know consider when they're returning to the city and I don't know. I think, you know, sometimes it seems like either side of, you know, I guess sort of our our duo here or group here, you know, doesn't have, I guess, sort of a understanding of everything that's going on. Because, you know, you definitely, you know, Cora, you know, she's doing sort of her, her typical character thing, at least in these earlier, you know, seasons where she's, you know, really driving home what her, you know, what she thinks her purpose is and what she's doing. And, you know, even though she, you know, she has, you know, I think slightly better idea of being neutral in certain situations. This is, you know, of course, one of those ones where from the get go, she was never really going to be there. So, you know, seeing them all sort of return to public city, sort of try to get their sort of bearings on what they want to do. And of course, you know, Bolin's sort of a little bit out there, not quite knowing what he's going to be doing, but, you know, you get to see him build up to his sort of, you know, new role for this book um, in the next couple of episodes here. So it's definitely, you know, I think it does a good job of at least setting the stage for what's happening because, you know, there is a lot going on and I think it is interesting. Maybe some of the ways they go about it maybe not be perfect, but I think the the setup for things and where, especially like where it leads up to is, is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely an attempt to use all of the characters here uh, and we'll see how it works. Uh, we do get a scene with Unalog here, which I actually think is quite an important one where, again, like you have a common criticism that like, why doesn't the book just focus on the two tribes at war, like really focus in on the civil war. And as we've discussed many times before, keep in mind who's like making the war actually happen and what their goals are. Neither side is particularly focused on sort of like the history of the two tribes necessarily. Unalak literally says in this scene, the number one priority from a military point of view is protecting the portal. He actually completely dismisses like Tonrock, even though he has like a rivalry with him. It's just like, don't focus on the um, the Southerners, just protect the portal. That's the only thing he cares about. And he actually reveals here that he lied to Korra in like the previous episode, that he does need Korra to open the portal. So he's going to send Eska and Desna after her to get uh, to get Korra back. So uh, again, we're kind <clears> of <throat> highlighting that um, Unalak's plan has gone a little bit off the rails here. He's still mostly in control here, but um, you can see the, the fact that he has sort of miscalculated this situation and we'll see kind of ultimately uh, what happens with that. But um, uh, any thoughts on this uh, Unalak scene? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a pretty good point to make that, you know, he's 
he definitely has his own priorities and they don't quite align with what you might think it would be in terms of this whole escalating situation and then there's other people that you know even he's not aware of who are also trying to sort of take advantage of the situation as we continue on so there's you know a couple different elements here and you no know, it's not really i don't know we always talk about the civil war but yeah like you're saying it's it's never quite about that even if that might be you know potentially a better plot line if that is what they would focus on mm-hmm uh, next, we'll actually just cover the entire Milo kind of uh, plot point just on its own here, <laughs> rather than separating it out, because it's it's relatively short, but it is a it is nice overall what they tried to do here, because we're building up Tenzin here. He wants to spend more time with his own children, and so this is the episode for the Milo focus. So we get uh, Milo wanting to train this lemur Pokey, who he's kind of grown attached to, but uh, Pokey's not really trained yet so uh, Tenzin helps Milo to train and it's all about like establishing dominance so that uh, uh, Pokey will actually listen to kind of Milo's commands and Tenzin just urges him to kind of basically have a bit of a strong hand when it comes to dealing with Pokey but Milo struggles with that because he more wants to have fun with Pokey but eventually he does go on to basically become the master trainer training every lemur on the island and Tenzin just is like oh uh, I pushed a bit too far here and is just like to Milo, just go have fun with Pokey. It's fine. You, you, you've you learned a little bit of a lesson here, but keep keep the fun in it. And it's just a, a nice little thing to just highlight that. Yeah, they, they spent some quality time together here. It didn't need to be anything huge because this is um, obviously apart from Rohan. This is the, the youngest of his uh, children. Um this was nice and, and and sets up a little bit of the kind of arc for, for Milo where he is kind of quite close with animals because we get the, the free comic book day book where he's also helping Korra to go after animals. So there's a little bit of that setup as well. But uh, do you have any thoughts on this kind of uh, airbender side of the episode? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a nice sort of like, you know, minor B plot to the episode that broke up, you know, when all the other sort of seriousness was going on. But yes, yeah, it's, it's cool to get to see, you know, Tenzin and Milo sort of interact here in a different sort of way and you know it's almost maybe sort of a little bit of a regression on Tenzin in terms of like his uh his teaching you know I guess you know uh techniques that sort of didn't quite work with Korra and he had to sort of back off so it's sort of like him sort of relearning that again with Milo here um but you no know, I guess you know in the grand scheme of things he he figured this one out a lot quicker than he did with Korra and everything that he you know them two went to out with together so um but yeah no i think it's you know it's a funny thing i mean you no know, it's always cool to see milo sort of go i guess sort of overboard with whatever he's doing before he sort of backs off on things so i guess it's sort of the the beginnings you can see of his sort of mm-hmm. own sort of personal character growth mm-hmm. um so yeah with that out of the way we we cut back to the republic city stuff and we're at the the peace march here Uh, Mako is obviously on duty during all of this, kind of uh, monitoring the kind of back streets a little bit. And uh, (laughs) yeah, he comes across the the bombers immediately. And obviously they're not directly, they don't immediately look like uh, northerners, which is what everyone is suspecting in the episode. Uh, They look more firebender. Uh, And basically what happens is that the Southern Cultural Center is bombed here. Uh, Mako bursts into action. Korra, of course, blames the North for this. But Mako points out that, you know, I directly saw people who weren't Northerners doing this and he moves off to uh, investigate. So um, this plot for Mako I actually like because um, it's it's basically like this and then it ends in, what, uh, 211, Night of a Thousand Stars. That general kind of core of this plot works, I think, really well. Some of the personal drama along the way is maybe a little much, but uh, I do appreciate the sort of... Mako progress in the police force arc that he gets this book because we know he is intelligent and so him immediately latching onto a a few of the things from this scene like the remote detonator the clothing the people are wearing and stuff like that shows signs of like being a good detective even though he's just a rookie officer at this point um but yeah this is a big issue here because of course the conflict between north and south has properly hit Republic City here at a peace march as well so it makes it kind of even worse but uh, what are your thoughts on this scene yeah I mean no 
I don't know. I think it's cool to see Mako in these sort of situations because it definitely shows a, a different side of his character that you might not necessarily think of, even though we get sort of hints of it throughout the whole show up until this point, and you know, even more so later on, him being sort of, you know, the the sort of you know, idea maybe brains behind you know certain situations or tactics rather. Um, so it's definitely sort of the the beginnings that we get to see of his character in these sort of situations, and you know, he's sort of the the odd man out here, but you can tell that you know from what everything's going on that he has his you know sort of heart in the right place and of course eventually he does become you know correct and everything but in the beginning here he's sort of like out on his own and has to sort of you know fight for what he he thinks is right even if it doesn't quite turn out well for like a bunch of more episodes mm-hmm uh, next scene we get a uh, relatively quick one but it's uh varick brings bolin to pro bending as a vip so the crowd it loves Bolin of course and he plays to the crowd and Varric sees this and is like oh I have an idea for Bolin and so this is effectively the start of Varric uh, pushing Bolin to be a mover star with the whole Nook Tuck hero of the south uh, situation. I, I just like this scene kind of getting to see you know Bolin goes back to pro bending but uh, this time as like a guest but he's still pretty famous because he's local of course um uh, just very fun to see because like he, he gets interviewed by Shiro Shinobi, of course, and uh, PJ Byrne does a great job with the kind of uh, <laughs> the voice acting here of just like the full on kind of kind of pro wrestling, you know, cheap pop stuff going on. So um, I, I, I like this scene quite a bit and I don't mind the kind of over the top nature of the Nook Tuck stuff. So um, I, I appreciate what they, this does for Bolin uh, overall. But uh, your thoughts on Varric Bolin here? Yeah, it definitely plays into Bolin's character at this point in time in terms of, you know, what he's able to do as far as just sort of, you know, speak off the top, you know, maybe not necessarily make a whole bunch of sense, but it's enough to sort of get people going. And, you know, he has, you know, like you said, he has his fame from before. So, you know, he has some of that to sort of pull on. And, you know, Varric, you know, has already taken him under the, the wing at this point. But now you can see that it's really going to go further here with, you know, what, you know, Bolin, you know, has the potential to do um, in the city. And of course, this all, you know, allies with, you know, Varric's other sort of underhanded goals as well. So it's all sort of, you know, coming together. But, you know, as sort of your first time watching this, you don't quite see where all the different threads are going. So it's a nice sort of uh, underlying sort of, uh, you know, plot that they're going for here. Mm -hmm. uh, then we get into probably one of the most important scenes of the episode. So this is Korra going to speak to President Raiko. So um, we see immediately the dynamic here, which is that Korra wants something done like immediately because she has seen in the south how bad things are and sees any like uh, messing about basically as being you know putting people at risk she, she wants action immediately whereas Raiko seems immediately more focused on the PR aspect of him meeting the avatar for the first time basically and um just playing it very safe with his decisions um He's reasonable to a certain degree, but it's also like a pretty severe unwillingness to work with Korra. Uh, and especially with how his character goes as the kind of seasons go on, um, it is not just sort of, you know, Korra comes in here a bit too over eager, which he is. This is a kind of continuous thing for Raiko that this is not a good dynamic that they have going on here it's even proven to be that way later on in the book as well so it's it's an interesting one where i think both are kind of both characters deserve criticism in this situation and in a way there is no obvious solution here because like it's not really maybe the correct decision to just full-on send troops down to the south and kind of assist in a war without maybe all of the details but not acting is also not great either so it's it's just that kind of frustrating thing and this is in general what Korra has been dealing with this book is like she is the avatar she wants to be the avatar but a lot of other characters not quite assisting her or maybe respecting the position uh, as a pseudo world leader uh, by themselves which Raiko certainly doesn't do he do he, he never seems to utilize Korra effectively like at all but uh, what are your thoughts on this scene here with, uh, is this the debut of Raiko? I think this is the first time we, apart from the, the intro to book two. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting seeing, you know, Korra at this point in time interact with, you know, 
another world leader or someone who's high up and has, you know, a position of power. Because, you know, generally, you know, she's, you know, hasn't quite done well with those type of people and, you know, her own status as the Avatar and how it sort of functions in this new world that's, you know, maybe more organized or, you know, doesn't have as much of a history or faith in the Avatar in terms of, you know, what this person can bring to the world. Um, you know, it's interesting to see how that plays out here, especially, you know, in Republic City, which is, you know, the most advanced, you know, we're considering, you know, place, you know, at least, you know, organization wise or politically, um, you know, in the Avatar world here. So, you know, Korra's sort of, you know, typical way of thinking in terms of getting things done and getting things done fast, you know, doesn't quite sit well with Raiko here. And even if he does sort of have like a bit of a, a thoughtfulness at the end of their conversation here, it still doesn't, you know, yield the results that Kor is looking for here. And, you know, Kor, like you said, you know, she's seen what's been happening there and, you know, there's, you know, she she already has this sort of mindset of what really needs to be done. And I don't know, Raiko doesn't really seem to have any sort of, you know, at least at this time, you know, any sort of idea or really sort of reason to sort of go and help here. I mean, you know, you would think maybe he might sort of like do like some sort of reconnaissance or, you know, get some information, you know, on the ground where things are happening. But it doesn't seem like he's really, you know, interested in that at all. Like he's, you know there to sort of take pictures first and to sort of be seen, which unfortunately is your sort of typical, you no know, politician type move here, which Cora definitely, you know, doesn't quite get how that works yet. So it's just sort of at odds at this point in time and doesn't really get better um, at any point in these next two episodes. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of this, uh, Varric does actually bring up the kind of like good point, because I think at one point Raiko says like, we can't get involved in like internal water tribe affairs, but like Varric just points out that like, like a bombing just happened like in your city between like northerners and southerners so like you're not involved in this like at all like i get it the the core of the issue is in the south basically but like it, it still involves like a third of your population effectively um because republic city is basically three nations kind of combined um so um that's obviously a point that like he doesn't really uh, have any response to as such but um uh we also right at the end of this scene do get kind of Cora and Mako uh, beginning to argue over their kind of like jobs and the kind of position that they're in uh and again you know it's it, it's a crazy situation they're kind of uh, uh not quite understanding each other but uh this will blow up more later on of course we'll get there um then uh Cora and Asami go to visit Varric. This is where he has the whole idea thing where he's he's, he's upside down. Uh, the idea is effectively just go speak to Iro directly, because he's a soldier, he might want to act um if they can do a kind of like undercover. Um and uh the other idea here is that Asami can sell mega tanks basically to the south, and that's how she can save her company. That's the idea here, is that we'll, we'll go to see Iroh, of course. Um, so, some fun Varric stuff there, and it kind of sets up that, like, okay, we're going to have to go behind Raiko's back, but Iroh is, was reasonable last time we, uh, we dealt with him, so pretty good stuff. And then a little bit of progress on the Asami plot here, that uh, some sort of a plan is coming into play. But uh, do you have any thoughts on this scene? Yeah, I mean, seeing Varric in here is interesting comparing to where he eventually ends up. But, you know, he has that whole sort of, you know, weird, you know, company owner, brilliant, but still crazy at the same time, which has, you know, been his vibe for the whole time here. Um, but it's interesting to see it sort of being in use in this sort of situation here and, you know, having all the other characters interact with him knowing that he can actually do you know some things he's just really really sort of uh eccentric in the ways that he goes about things but yeah it's, it's definitely a fun sort of scene with him and getting to see his first sort of idea for the movers and how that can sort of help their political means as well it's interesting how that's sort of beginning to show how that's going to lead into things later on and no thing i guess sort of uh just them interact here is interesting mm-hmm uh, after this, we get a scene uh, where basically it's the kind of debut, in a way, of the mover. Um, they show kind of one of the episodes. And by the end of it, you realize, okay, this is this is actually just a propaganda video, like, against the North. And Varric's pretty clear about that, of, like, he's trying to turn the city against uh, Raiko. That, hey, 
the movers are telling me I should hate Unalak and everything that he does, but uh, Raiko's over here not acting against him. So um, you sort of see what Varric is kind of trying to do here, like with um, the... Like, obviously, with the, the advanced knowledge of, like, oh, he ends up being the villain, like, his suggestion to Asami, what he's doing here, what he's done in all the previous episodes, you can see it all mm-hmm. working in his favor and that, like, he kind of is behind so much that's going on here because, again, all Unalak is doing is Spirit Portal. He's all Spirit Portal, Spirit Portal, Spirit Portal. So everything else happening is just, like, Varric making the war happen. So it's... um. It's pretty it's pretty interesting stuff, um, and I actually think it's... He's never probably going to be the standout villain because he has the redemption, and we, we know him primarily as the, the kind of changed character, but um, he's a pretty interesting villain when you look back on what he's done so far. Um, but uh, any, any thoughts on this uh, movers thing? Yeah, no, him... He definitely, you know, has the machinations of, like, putting things in his favor and sort of pushing things towards his own goals. And I think that's, you know, why he can be interesting rather than sort of his sort of, you know, over the top sort of persona might lead you to be, uh, believe for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, next up, we have uh, Raiko. The, the one thing he actually does do is he does go to Lin, but basically just screams at the chief of police to just solve the crime quicker. Like that that's what he he thinks is like gonna just fully help the situation solve it. Um Mako of course thinks he has a really, really big lead at this point, but of course this is where we get Lin sort of chewing him out for being a rookie, as well as Lu and Gon pretty much trying to purposefully get Mako into trouble. They're the detectives, he's the rookie cop. Uh but we know Mako is correct and it's like a criticism of Lin, Lu and Gon that they just seem set in their ways and just won't listen to Mako. It's um, it is a very frustrating scene for Mako. Um, but uh, when he comes out, he of course speaks to Mako. He's actually heard some good things about him and is like, pretty directly, you're dating the Avatar. Basically, is she up to anything? Tell me. I'm asking you directly. And Mako is forced to sort of tell the truth because through Bolin, Mako has found out about the go to see Iro plan. Um, and this sets up what's like just about to happen, basically. Um, so, very interesting scene here, where of course it's 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 Raiko kind of getting in Korra's way here. Um, Mako, it's it's a weird one where like I don't think you can criticize him too much for just like forced to be honest in front of the president here, but uh, it, it's a mix of emotions for Mako in this scene because you're like. You feel so sorry that he's being um, looked over by Lin and everyone when he's right and then put into this crazy situation afterwards. So um, I actually like the kind of um, nuance to kind of what's happening here with him. But uh, what are your thoughts on this Mako scene? Yeah, it just seems like he just can't get a break in this sort of situation because he, he has the idea. He's, you know, we know he's right. He thinks he's probably right. Um, and then he's just put in an even more sort of uncomfortable situation here. And yeah, I don't you know. I don't know even if he didn't tell, would it have been sort of the right thing? And if it would have turned out in the end, you know, sort of, you know, the way that Core would have wanted to, because, you know, that sort of mobilization probably would have gotten noticed anyway. So, you know, maybe it's for the best that it did sort of turn out this way, but it definitely doesn't help Mako at all in any sort of his, you know, sort of endeavors um, and everything that he's going. So it's, it's just, you know, a bit sort of frustration, but this is, you know, I guess sort of pretty typical of the the new guy there that you know, no one quite sort of listens to you until you're really able to sort of prove yourself. It's just unfortunate that he has to go through all these different things and, you know, couple more episodes in order to actually be seen that you know he was right and he told everyone Mm -hmm. and uh, i i know that this is a point where like a lot of people maybe criticize the the characterization of lin here that like why is lin written to not listen to another character but it's just like uh did you see like early lin in book one and like the reason she turned around on korra was because she saw how tough Korra was like in action and they you know grew to have some scenes together and I get the same thing is sort of happening here with Mako he's done some good stuff but in her mind she's uh uh he she just sees him as a rookie still and um, I think this is a perfectly fine flaw for Lin to have that as the chief of police she does have a little bit of the she's created a, maybe a little bit of an atmosphere where you kind of uh 
don't give a lot of respect to the rookies. Um, and I think that fits with her character fairly well because she does then react to pro- being kind of proven wrong um, and basically you know promotes and demotes uh, the, the the right characters after this. So I think it's like it's it's not an arc for Lynn as such, but like I think it's the a correct use of the character. Like I, I would never view Lynn as being like mischaracterized here. Uh, because her and Cora was a very specific thing, what happened in book one. But uh, do, do you have any thoughts on that, uh, the, the characterization of Lynn? She's, she's obviously not a focus in this book, but uh, here's her kind of moments. Yeah, yeah, she does, <clears throat> she does have a couple different moments in this episode. And I don't know, I mean, I think, you know, that's pretty sort of, you know, typical for someone in charge to sort of believe, you know, the more sort of senior people over the sort of, newer usually sort of younger type characters not that that's always right of course but you know in this sort of situation and you know not i guess lynn being sort of as aware how much these you know current detectives are sort of like you know bumbling sort of fools for the most part um no it might make sense that she might believe him in this sort of situation here and like you said she does sort of you know retroactively sort of like correct things so it does show that she is able to see that you know she is wrong like you know she was a bit sort of wrong about Cora before and she's able to sort of come around on that sort of point here um so yeah it just you know it's one of those things especially with an older character it takes them a little bit longer to sort of change in their ways compared to sort of the younger ones. So I think, you know, for the most part, that doesn't really bother me in terms of these sort of episodes and her sort of, you know, I guess, mini sort of character through line. Mm-hmm. Uh, and next, yeah, we, we do have the scene where uh, Cora goes to speak to Iroh and it's going well. She actually manages to basically convince him and like he comes up with a nice story of us like, oh, yeah, we'll go out on a kind of training mission. We'll encounter them. We'll have to defend ourselves. It'll be fine. It'll be great. I, I support the Avatar. And then Raiko shows up and is immediately like, you know, what are you doing here? This is like insurrection, basically. Um, basically, you know, get back in your lane, Korra. You're just the Avatar. I'm the president. Um, so that gets shut down. And Iroh's like, yep, yeah, officially hands tied there. Uh, but he does say to Korra, uh, go to speak to my mother, the Fire Lord. Um she may be willing to help you in your situation. So uh, this is an interesting one, because obviously this doesn't really get paid off. One, we still haven't been to the Fire Nation in the Korra era. Uh, we have seen Fire Lord Izumi, <laughs> of course, uh, in book four, but um, we really don't get a lot uh, with this, because um, this obviously is stopped, as we'll see, from happening in, in pretty much the next scene. So Korra does basically plan to do this, uh, but she knows she's sort of been betrayed here, because there's no way... Raiko would just randomly kind of turn up here. So, um, what are your thoughts on the scene here with Iro? Yeah, yeah, it definitely is too bad they couldn't have quite, you know, got the help that she wanted there. But I don't know. I think it's, it just goes to show you that there's all these, you know, different things that are going on around it. And you know, even though she is the Avatar and she does have some sway with people who, you know, who have seen her in action, who do have, you know some faith in her ability, you know, as sort of the avatar, which Iroh, you know, especially with all of his family history, even if he doesn't notice avatar as much, but, you know, we know these two have already worked together, um, you know, is willing to sort of, you know, take that sort of leap of faith here. Um, but, you know, it does make me wonder if we ever did go to the Fire Nation, you know, would Izumi have helped in this sort of situation? I don't, I don't know. I mean, from what we've seen so far from, you know, future episodes and stuff, I'm not quite sure quite sure that that would have worked any sort of better in this case but it's no it's just too bad that you know Cora's is getting you know sort of cut off from another idea that she had that you no know, potentially could have worked yeah i think everything we know about izumi it probably would have been like no because she really doesn't want to in any way involve the fire nation in something that resembles like a war even if it would be helping like another nation so <clears throat> i don't know like maybe she would have offered supplies or something like that but it wouldn't have been exactly what Cora wants, and it might have created another situation where she's maybe on bad terms with another world leader because Cora and Azumi never really interact directly. So it's it's a bit of a kind of interesting one there. But from here, uh, we do get Cora confronts Mako for this uh, betrayal, 
uh, they have a big screaming argument here. They break up um, because it seems like their kind of jobs have, have gotten in the way of their relationship. Um, uh, this results in Korra heading off in tears uh, on the speedboat to the Fire Nation. She gets confronted by uh, Eska and Desna from earlier on in the episode. She does kind of fend them off, but they, they more or less back off because they see a big spirit incoming. So giant dark spirit here. Korra attempts to spirit bend it. There's like Avatar State stuff that happens here. Uh, it doesn't quite work. And she basically is swallowed by the dark spirit and then uh, spit up kind of later on. Um, obviously, as we see at the end of episode six. But the episode ends with Eska and Desna leaving, assuming that Korra has been killed by this dark spirit because they just saw her get eaten, basically. So a uh, really rough time here for Korra as the uh, episode comes to an end. We, of course, get the breakup of mm -hmm. Mako and Korra. I've always felt that, like, I, I I understand why it happens here because I think, you know, the everything is so, so intense, kind of heat of the moment. Something like this, I think, was going to happen. Um, I've never been a fan of how they kind of ultimately resolve this at the end of the book uh, because it feels like they they take how these characters uh, act in a like huge moment of stress and kind of move that on to kind of represent their entire relationship when like the entire episodes before this like one two three four have shown that even with little complications coming up they can actually like get through them and that Every single time is not always going to be like this time. This is just a very specific uh, circumstance where things are not going well. It's before both characters have developed. Um, I, I would always just say I think the breakup of Mako and Bolin over the course of book two, uh, Mak sorry, Mako and uh, Korra, um, was never the best written breakup. But if this is kind of what has to happen to get us to the uh, less dramatic romance from like book three onward, onwards, I'm fairly okay with it because it's not like a super hardcore ship, <laughs> Korra and Mako. I'm pretty fine with whatever <laughs> they do. Uh, it's just like I felt that some of this stuff was a little forced. And like I said, I'm never a fan of the, the hashtag drama that's kind of going on here where it's just the two of them kind of screaming at each other. Um, it's it's realistic to a certain extent, but I, I think it's a it's a bit much at times. But uh, what what are your thoughts on this uh, final scene of? Mm, yeah, it definitely can be a a bit much how they're doing sort of the relationships, but that does you know I guess with the way that the characters are and just sort of the world in general, maybe things are just more sort of slightly more amped in general. But you know the overall ending of the episode it definitely sort of you know puts you on sort of you know slight edge of what's really happening with Korra because it just seems like you know. Again and again, you know, all the characters in this, except for Bolin, who, you know, seems to be doing well with the movers and everything, um, you know, can't really get a break at all. Um, the whole ending scene, I think, is pretty cool with Korra and the sort of twins and sort of chasing on the water and how they're sort of going back and forth. So I think that's definitely a cool way to sort of end the episode with this sort of like action beat, even if it, it really isn't that long in the grand sort of scheme of things. But, you know, it feels like it has more going for it because um, we know what else is going on overall. And, you know, we can see, you know, Korra almost quite, you know, uh, perfect sort of the, the spirit cleansing sort of technique here but you know it doesn't quite work yet she hasn't quite got the sort of full grasp of it here and you know the spirit here i think is, is pretty cool it's pretty unique compared to some of the other ones we see um so I, I definitely like that sort of design overall but yeah definitely you know seems like uh things aren't gonna go you know quite so well for core as far as we know mm -hmm. <clears throat> So we move into uh, 206, uh, The Sting, immediately. So we start off with a scene where uh, basically uh, the shipment of goods that Asami was going to like sell to the south uh, also gets taken at sea. So there was a risk to doing this, and it seems that risk hasn't paid off. This puts even more pressure on um, Asami going forward. But it's also part of the mystery that um, it wasn't the spirits that uh, took down this ship. It was uh, some sort of a attack here uh, close to uh, Republic City waters so uh, we'll get more on that kind of uh, going forward. We do get a scene here with uh, Unalak at the start which uh, is very very interesting and, and because we don't know a lot of the details about how the spirit world works at this point into the kind of franchise just something as kind of crazy as like Eska and Desna arrive at the portal and then Unalak just walks out and they're like 
what were you, were you just in the spirit world and he's like yeah 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 um, but tell me what happened so they report back they're, they're convinced Korra is dead and Unalak is in a bit of a tough position where he has to believe that this is the case and he's stuck in a terrible position now where he's going to have to risk a lot to try and force the portal open so uh, very interesting stuff uh, just kind of reflecting on the scene realizing that like oh yeah this is sort of like the debut of the whole just you can walk into the spirit portal go go places i believe unalak mentioned to Korra in one of the earlier episodes that this was possible to do like transport basically between the two tribes would be very easy but seeing it happen is like oh that's new and um, but uh, any thoughts on this uh, Unalak scene and, and the opening scene of the Yeah, no, I think there is a point to be made there that, you know, we're not, you know, the spirit stuff is always interesting to see and to see how it actually works. And, you know, also the idea that you just don't know what Unalak's actually doing there. Like, we know that, you know, eventually there's stuff going on there. But, you know, even our characters here, um, you know, the twins, they don't quite know, you know, this isn't quite something that you're used to seeing in any sort of regard here and you no know, we know he's the most you no know, one of the more spiritual characters that we've seen so far in this series so clearly he has uh some advantage and some knowledge that you know we're not sort of privy to here but yeah it's definitely you know an amped up like a sort of you know curious starting you know sort of a couple of mysteries here that we're waiting to figure out what they really mean mm-hmm. um yeah we just get another kind of Bolin, Nook Tuk kind of scene. It's a big success. Um, again, it's propaganda to force Raiko to help the South scene. Um, but then we do get Mako informing Asami about the loss of the shipment. Uh, he also finds out about the explosions being ro- remote detonations at this point uh, and makes uh, you know, a connection, basically. Again, this is another one of the scenes where he walks in. His opinion is dismissed because he is a rookie, even though this is a really concrete kind of connection that he's made here. He maybe is missing like a really clear piece of evidence, but he's made a connection. Uh, but again, he is dismissed. Uh, he's not going to get any official support on this. And this prompts him to, of course, come up with the sting operation. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, Asami, you know, her situation grows worse and worse. Malko's situation grows worse and worse. And they're forced into a a desperate kind of plan here but uh what are your thoughts on this scene yeah no they're they're definitely pretty desperate at this point i mean you know marco really does have like you're saying you know good ideas it's just unfortunate that only he can see these sort of like you know connections here because he of course is the only one that's sort of been involved with it so i don't know it makes you wonder if lynn had been a little bit more open to him investigating from the beginning you know would this have turned out differently? I mean, he he just, you know, really just doesn't have the trust of anyone, most so mainly just Lynn, in order to sort of, you know, have these sort of ideas that he has sort of become together. And, you know, with it missing key things, like you're saying, you know, it's like he has this item here, he has this picture, but that, you know, alone doesn't sort of make the connection. And also he might just not be doing it in the sort of right sort of way, like doing it in this sort of interrogation situation, you know, probably wouldn't be sort of the, the best way to go about it but he's you know sort of like core he's pretty sort of like direct in the way of his thinking and you know maybe just because you know he has someone who's personally involved with it that also just doesn't sort of help the situation out at all um either here so yeah it's definitely just sort of you know unfortunate timing for everything that's going on here and he's really trying to you know sort of help the best way that he can or at least he thinks he can mm. Yeah, and I think that's kind of part of the, the writing issue here is that from that point of view, Mako and Korra actually are kind of facing very similar kind of issues of by, in terms of like mm-hmm. they are trying to make a very valid point to people in basically a higher position like above them and are not being listened to. But like when they themselves interact with each other, basically because Mako effectively like works for Raiko, this kind of creates the issue between them when... I think there was kind of a clear path to just like do the kind of arc of they both go on their character arc they're away from each other for a while they come back together and are better and they do it that way that way like the the drama would have meant something because they both grew uh, after that but they just choose to be like we are incompatible at the end of the the, the book even though it's maybe not set up as well uh, especially because they ultimately go with the idea that like we're going to be best friends, like, we are the most loyal people to each other, but, like, 
for some for some reason our romantic relationship doesn't work and um, it's a bit of a, a weird one here and that's where it's a bit forced but um overall um it's you know they, they try to to do some stuff here and, and for mako that this arc i think works when he eventually is proven right so uh this is where he's you know uh he comes up with the sting operation but he kind of he and asami can't do it on their own they need other people he tries to get bolin's help but this is where some of the stuff from like the start of the previous episode comes back to bite him where he kind of dismissed bolin before bolin had gotten into the whole movers stuff basically like find something to do now he wants his help but bolin is actually busy doing his own stuff and so he gives mako the same advice that he gave him and so you know it's, it's not a major conflict between the brothers yet but you can see the dismissal here. Mako wants Bolin's help, but uh, Bolin doesn't really want to give it right now because things are going pretty well for him. Um, so uh, that's uh, you know, pretty interesting overall. Um, and this then prompts him to get help from the triple threat triad. So this is where they hire them because their, their plan is basically to get a boat sail it out to the same place where the boats keep getting uh, got and hopefully find out what's going on so what are your thoughts on uh, this scene yeah i mean you know mako i mean you know maki and asami they're really you know like we were saying earlier this this is really sort of like a quick you know sort of low point for them the fact that they're sort of going towards these sort of gangsters and trying to use them in order to sort of make this sort of sting operation which you know already seems like kind of a, a risky deal here and you know we don't know that there's even more going on behind the scenes at this point in time here but definitely seems like it's not something that you really want to do and you know it's surprising that maybe he didn't even get sort of ratted out even before this just sort of you know by you know, association of going here so it's it's really one of those points where it's definitely like he's this is sort of you know like we're saying before comparing him with Cora, just like this is the equivalent of him you know of Korra going to Iroh here, just that he actually gets their help, but this is almost sort of, you know, worse in that situation because it just turns out all all sorts of wrong after this whole situation with the Sting operation. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, uh, in the middle of all this, when they're finally on the boat and stuff like that, Mako is forced to reveal that he and Korra have broken up and like Asami overhears this and stuff like that. But then immediately he overhears Viper, the leader of the, the Triple Threat, who... Um, is obviously the character who is uh what would we call it like half killed off in turf wars because there's like two of him all of a sudden and that whole situation does is this character dead now or not it, it's very young um but over here's viper mentioning that basically they've been hired to quote unquote double cross uh, mako and just keep them out of the way distracting them for something so there's a whole sequence here uh big escape sequence mako and uh uh, Sammy teaming up, they get on a speedboat, there's a kind of fight uh, between speedboats, and um, they eventually manage to get back to uh, Sammy's warehouse and find that it has been completely robbed, there's nothing left, and Sammy just kind of flat out says, I'm ruined. Um, but Mako tries to kind of give her hope, is basically like, like, don't give up, I'm here for you. Then Sammy kisses Mako and there's a bit of an awkward situation and even though it's a very awkward situation they go ahead with this relationship this is to me the most confusing writing decision in like the entire book like this is where it, it really becomes clear that you don't have a clue what to do with, with asami this book do you because the resolution for asami of this plot is just that mako's proven right barak's arrested asami gets her company back this relationship amounts to like nothing effectively by the end of the book this is messy writing in my opinion i just think there's no other real way to do this because at least in my opinion i would say masami <laughs> mako and asami is probably like the least popular of like the main ships among the like Korra characters so like why they decided to go back to this was a little bit weird because I, w I wouldn't mind if it, if it was just that one scene where Sammy like felt that this was a moment and it just doesn't happen but the fact that they go ahead with it is kind of very weird to me and it and is a signifier to me that they want the drama they want the shipping drama they haven't realized yet that this is a problem 
uh, and it's only after this they kind of course correct but um what are your thoughts on this uh, whole sequence here with the triple threats the escape sequence and then the uh the drama moments at the end here yeah there, there definitely is a good bit going on here and you know i think you know the idea of a sting operation you know it seems solid it seems like something that would work it just you know doesn't work out that they're sort of you know being led on this sort of like goose chase essentially here in terms of you know these you know who they're trying to capture um but they don't even know who they are so i don't know maybe they could have done more in terms of like figuring that whole you know side of the equation out but you know the whole chase scene i think is pretty cool i like how they sort of go back and forth from the boats and everything like that like i think you know avatar has done some pretty good sort of uh speed chase scenes here and whatever sort of you know medium that they are sort of traveling in um so this one is there's no different from any of the other ones we've seen so that part is definitely pretty done pretty well and yeah it definitely seems like this is just sort of a low point that they're having here and yeah the the whole idea of the drama is you no know, i don't know it's, it's weird it definitely feels like it it might be sort of misplaced especially just because we've we've sort of already had this i think it might not have been you know sort of at its bad if this was sort of like the first time and we didn't have all the issues from before but we've already seen some of our characters sort of you know go through this sort of drama already and you know it wasn't particularly well received before um as well not that that had any sort of like direct influence on this one considering you know how production goes in terms of you know story and writing and stuff like that um but you know in lieu of what they've done before and you know how it eventually turns out it definitely seems like it you know might have been misplaced or maybe it could have been you know tweaked in a different way where you know it still could have had the same sort of ideas, but it just was resolved differently. That might have been made it, I guess, a little bit more palatable for more people here. But no, it definitely, you know, causes some things to sort of happen later on, which, you know, I don't know, you know, you may or may not like. Yeah, I think the main problem is just that stuff like this sort of becomes like Mako's like legacy of Korra, like as a character. You know, like his recap and remembrances mm -hmm. is relationship drama. That's what they focus on for, like, Mako's recap. Korra gets a pretty standard one. Bolin gets a kind of humorous one. Mako gets relationship recap, even though there's there's other stuff that goes on with him. And the worst part is that, obviously, they kind of mischaracterize it. Like, they, like, in back in book one, like, everyone seems to forget that it was, like, Korra who kissed Mako uh, in the middle of all of that. And in here, it's a Sammy who kisses Mako. Now, you can criticize Mako for kind of like in the aftermath of this, kind of like how he handles this, some of the communication issues. The writers, for some reason, just choose to have Mako be in all of these unusual situations. Um, we are still waiting patiently for this Mako comic to hopefully get the character back on track. He was, he was better in like Runes of the Empire a little bit, even though he wasn't much of a focus. Hopefully the comic that we get going forward can just kind of give him more of a direction and stuff like that. Because uh, the, there, there are some frustrating things that happen with the character, despite like book one, he's presented really, really well. And even as we go forward, they still make sure to do a couple of really big moments with him. But they always seem to just always go back to look at all the drama that like he caused apparently it's just uh it's a bit frustrating for the character um but anyway uh mako then goes to see bolin at the uh, movers shoot and um, this is where he sees that oh they're on the set they are using the remote explosives and in fact he finds out those remote explosives are exclusive to varic industries um and so he realizes in this moment that that must mean varic is behind like pretty much everything that's happened here so he rushes to tell asami but he arrives right in time to see asami basically signing future industries away to varic in an attempt to quote unquote save the company and so it's this standoff here as i think they both realize they know what each other knows and mako is forced to just be like uh, i'll i'll prove this eventually <laughs> um so I actually really like this scene. I, I think it's a very dramatic scene of the villain Varric reveal right as Mako rushes to, to tell Asami. So um, I actually think this whole scene out here is really well done with the explosives on set. You you see the, the cogs whirling in uh, Mako's mind to figure this out. So this was actually very well written in comparison to the previous scene. But uh, your thoughts on uh, Mako figuring it out here? 
Yeah, no, I think you're you're right there. That it definitely comes across pretty clear, you know, without any need for like a, a light bulb above the head or anything like that. That he he's putting together all these connection points. We get to see, you know, sort of Detective Mako sort of really work in this sort of situation here. And, you know, he does try to confront, you know, sort of the situation sort of head on. It just sort of happens that sort of Varric beat him to it. I, I wonder if he wasn't sort of so loud with his sort of assumptions, you know, could he have gotten away with this longer? And maybe sort of uh, what happens to him later on, maybe not quite have happened. But I don't know. I feel like Varric probably had a good idea of what was going on regardless here. But, yeah, definitely... Definitely the idea of the Varric villain here comes across pretty straightforward. I mean, he doesn't quite make, you know, he only makes sort of like one sort of uh, sort of like funny joke moment at this whole point here. But, you know, the fact that he has sort of the the serious face that we almost never see from him for the most part, you know, is pretty telling. Mm-hmm. And and this is interesting because, like, uh, especially with more recent content where, like, from the RPG, uh, the Korra era adventure with Varric, we got, like, this other backstory where... He does have this kind of history of like he effectively kind of uh, you know kind of stole the a deal from like uh, someone in his past and that's what causes that whole adventure to to happen. So this is kind of like classic Varric here before he kind of changes for the better. So and um, I, I like that this fits in with some of that stuff as well. But uh, the final scene of this episode to set up beginnings coming up next, Cora washes up unconscious on Bonte Island. She is found by the fire sages there. They know who she is. They're like, oh, Avatar Korra, uh, what are you doing here? How did you end up here? And she's like, wait, where am I? Wait, who am I? Who, what's, who's Avatar Korra? And so it's this real shocking moment where you're kind of questioning, like, wait, she was on her way to the Fire Nation, so it's, it must be some sort of fire island. She's she's on here. Fire sages um of course, at this point, we don't know it's Bonte Island, it's the Bonte tribe, and um, that stuff didn't get confirmed for for a while after this. But it's still a kind of crazy situation that, like, she doesn't remember anything. Like, what a unusual kind of, like, mid-season cliffhanger for the character that she's completely <laughs> out of action on this random island. But uh, what are your thoughts on this final scene here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, considering we didn't know sort of what really happened to her and we're presuming that she's, you know, dead in the beginning here, you know, seeing her here, I guess, you know, could be a bit of a shocker to some. But I think, you know, just as equally the fact that she doesn't know who she is or where she is and, you know, we don't really know where she is at this point. It's definitely, you know, pretty shocking here and leaves you with like a lot of questions like, you know, like you're saying, like this mid-season sort of cliffhanger here is... You know, maybe not particularly what you were sort of expecting, but I think this is probably, you know, more interesting than a lot of the other things that we've seen so far. So, you know, despite the episode overall, you know, not having sort of the the highest of marks over it, um, it's definitely leading us towards, you know, the more interesting bits of uh, the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Like, we, we go from the probably the two weakest episodes to the two best, pretty much. Um, so that's a really interesting uh, shift. Obviously, this is also where the kind of animation studio kind of like switches back over for a little bit. There's one more final studio uh, Piero episode, uh, which is episode nine, um, but uh, that there's that as well. So yeah, uh, it means for Korra, both beginnings episodes will be on the next uh, rewatch, which is pretty exciting, uh, of course. Um, but we'll do our Avatar episode for this time out, which is 203: Return to Omashu. So. We're still in early book to Earth here. Uh, we, of course, had the cliffhanger from the last time out. Omashu has been taken over by the Fire Nation. And that's what we kind of discuss at the very beginning here, which is that, oh, there's only one final kind of bastion city left in the Earth Kingdom. Uh, ba Sing Se is the last holdout against the Fire Nation now that Omashu has fallen. And... Both Katara and uh, Sokka at the start here are kind of urging Aang to kind of be like, we need to move on and we'll find someone else to to teach you earth bending. Um, it's not worth it to kind of go in there. But Aang stands his ground and for more reasons than just the training is like, Boomy is my friend. I'm going to go in there and get him. And you definitely get the sense that this is very much informed by the fact that Boomy is like one of the only pretty much the only person left from 
his his own era basically um, pre ice and that adds a lot to this he's going to make sure to find out what's up with boomy save him if possible because it's one of his only connections his previous life effectively um so i actually really like this uh, opening scene getting across the significance of the, the the loss of omashu here but also how important boomy is to ang as well but uh, what are your thoughts on this opening scene here of return to omashu yeah, no, it, it definitely does show. I mean, you know, Aang's all about sort of his connections with people and sort of his, you know, empathy that he has. And, you know, like you're saying, the fact that this is, you know, one of the people that he's known from before he was stuck in the ice, you know, makes it all the more so, like, important to him that he would, you know, go through any sort of lengths of, you know, helping out a friend here. And, you know, just the, the fact of how to even get into the city, you know, speaks, you know, volumes on that sort of you know idea now that he knows that there's something you know worth it to going towards the city because yeah i mean you know realistically there is you know sort of you know a ton of you know other earthbenders you know maybe maybe not quite on the level of you know boomy but you know that could definitely train him in this regard but you know he has sort of you know the idea that he's you know he has to save you know his friend and that's what he's going to do and you know Understanding that, you know, Katara and Saka are definitely, you know, all for it in that sort of case. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we, we, we head in through the sewers um, and when we get out, we pretty quickly encounter the um, purple uh, pentapus uh, and the whole concept of pentapox is uh, started here as they get discovered by some Fire Nation guards. They're able to kind of just be like, oh, we're just kids out after curfew. We'll, we'll go back. Um, but... The guard notices that there's the little uh, dots left over from the uh, pentapus on Sokka. And so Katara quickly makes up that it's pentapox and it's contagious. And there's this kind of running gag throughout the episode that it's a completely made up illness or disease. But everyone is just like, oh, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of this before. This person in my family died of it or, you know, they, they know about it, even though it's completely made up, which is hilarious. But they managed to get away with that. And uh, that's where we sort of cut to the uh, other side of the episode. But um, I suppose, what are your thoughts on this? Because this is an interesting thing with Avatar, say, compared to Korra, is that Korra rarely gets the time to set up a, a kind of running gag like this that is actually quite an important plot point and just spend like five minutes of the episode to have a made-up disease be a major focus of the episode. How do you like the uh, Pentapox stuff? Yeah, I think it's interesting that you're saying that because it, it definitely does. I mean, you know, the list, the running time, and I guess maybe just sort of the fore planning that Avatar, the original series, had just sort of leads it more towards these sort of particular sort of, you know, extra bits in the episode, which, you know, it does become a pretty important plot point overall, as we see later on in the episode. So it's it's not without sort of reason here, but no, it definitely comes off initially as sort of just sort of a a fun sort of gag that sort of helps them get into the city and you know it just leads into sort of a bigger thing um but you know there's also just sort of the idea of just you know introducing you know sort of a, a unique sort of animal creature um into the avatar world that you know sort of stands out because a lot of people do you know particularly mention this as one of their sort of random favorite sort of creatures so you know it has that sort of benefit as well as just sort of you know building on you know this world in general which makes it you know feel all the more alive for people who are interested in it Mm -hmm. we then cut over to the other side of the episode which is really important here uh, and that is azula takes the advice of lo and lee her advisors which is that uh it's not going to be particularly effective to go after iroh and zuko who are kind of sneaking around on the run having the whole like royal kind of guard with her the palanquin at all times she's going to need a small sort of strike team and she agrees, and so she says that she's going to get some old friends to join her. We begin the formation of the uh, Ozai's Angels, as sometimes they get called, but uh, this trio of characters is uh, very, very memorable, but uh, this is only the uh, the setup scene there. So I do like this these early stages where like uh, Azula actually listened to Lo and Lee, and you see as, as time goes on, she grows to <laughs> listen to them less and less, but... Um, what are your thoughts on this first Azula scene? Yeah, I think it's a it's a good sort of, I guess, sort of initial impressions of sort of Azula in this sort of situation of, you know, 
understand this situation being calculating, you know, beginning to formulate a plan and you no, know, eventually throughout the episode we get to see how it actually works here. So yeah, it's definitely a good start to this character that we're not, you know, so at this time, you no, know, completely, you know, fully understand like sort of her her morals and her goals and sort of what she wants to do in the end. But you no, know, it's enough that we're sort of getting it um at this point here and you know, we see where it leads. Mm-hmm. We then cut back to Amashu, but the uh, new leadership of Amashu. So we have um, uh, Governor Ukano here with his wife, uh, Michi, and then their daughter, um, May, uh, as well as son, Tom Tom here. So this is a, an interesting setup here where like we cut straight from old friends to introduce May, but May is actually the second addition to the team. And it's a bit of a reveal right at the end of the... As is presented here, we just get that... May is very unhappy here in Omashu. She's incredibly bored by everything that's happening, but it's just sort of assured by her mother that like, oh, your, your father is uh, so successful. This is a great honor that he's the governor of uh, Omashu here now that we've taken over. Uh, but she, of course, uh, doesn't particularly care about her father's political career. She's just sort of along for the ride here and doesn't particularly care. Uh, it's at this point an assassination attempt basically happens. Uh, the uh, the rebels here are uh, the resistance just try to take out like Mei, Michi, and Tom Tom with a big earth bending attack, and Ang actually stops it as they're kind of sneaking around. Um, and this is where of course Ang and Co get sort of brought before the resistance here to find out what happened. So. A uh, pretty interesting setup for May. I know some people don't like her because of her kind of personality of like not being particularly emotional. I've always been a big fan of the character here, and I like just that contrast of like this is a reasonable position for her, but she's just incredibly bored here, and it makes for a nice kind of contrast between like the, she's not even asked effectively to join the team. It just sort of happens at the end of the uh, episode. Uh, she's so eager to join versus what happens with Ty Lee. Um, and just the complete contrast to her being so unhappy having to be the kind of governor's daughter here. Um, but uh, what are your thoughts here on the uh, the introduction of May um, uh, and uh, the rest of her family as well? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I never really particularly had like a strong, I guess, dislike of a character. It seems sort of like your sort of typical sort of, you know, emo, you no, know, just sort of semi-depressed sort of type of teen. But, you know, she clearly has, you know, some motivations. She has, you know, some skill, as we see here, when, you know, she's trying to track down, you know, the group here. So she has, you know, her own things sort of going for her that we, you know, don't quite see. And we don't really, you know, sort of get the full idea of how she sort of has this sort of, you know, techniques and stuff. But, you know, it seems like when she when she does get going, she's pretty interesting in terms of what she's doing in terms of her actions and stuff. So I think it's it's a cool introduction to this character that, you know, otherwise doesn't seem like they're sort of interested in anything sort of going on and just sort of the idea of, you know, who are these people that are sort of, you know, controlling this city at this point in time and sort of the the lengths that this other sort of, you know, rebellious sort of faction, at least according to them, um, is willing to sort of change things that are going on because, it, you know, it is pretty dark what they're trying to do there, but, you know, Aang just happens to sort of interrupt it. Mm-hmm. And then um, I, I do think it's just sort of interesting here that, like, Ukano is relatively forgettable in this episode. He's not much of a character but he's super interesting in Smoke and Shadow, where like they properly like uh, characterize him and mm-hmm, uh, play mm-hmm. on what's going on with him. Um, I, I just uh, think that's a that's a pretty good use that you forget that like oh yeah he's in this episode. It's not just May on her own; her whole family is there. Um, but uh, it's only in the comic that you really get to see the the real Ukano basically. But they do still keep in the fact that like the the family do care about like Tom Tom and stuff like that. Like they are a family; they're not. They're not all villains here. Um, but anyway, next we actually cut over to Azula finding her old friend Ty Lee at the circus. And we immediately get the idea here that like Azula's like, uh, why are you here? Like, we both went to the Royal Fire Academy for girls. Like, you're, you're the uh, daughter of nobles. Why are you working in the circus? And we get straight away that like Ty Lee is basically the exact opposite of May. She's so happy, peppy, and she's always talking about uh, auras and stuff like that. And she is, says her her aura has never been better be, than being at the circus and I suppose away from the nobility and stuff like that. 
we'll later on later on in the series find out more specifically kind of why this happened but um um azula just straight up asks her uh, <laughs> do you want to go help me capture like my uncle and stuff like that but she says she's not interested because she's found herself basically at the circus azula seems okay with it but then decides last second uh, i'm gonna stick around and watch the show and you can immediately see kind of tylee's um a kind of attitude change where suddenly she goes from being like happy nice to meet azula again she's going off to oh no she's sticking around to watch the show and you really get the sense that she sort of knows what is about to happen here and and given that we're, we're kind of talking about this a lot with like current content like azula's redemption how close is she or was she to may and tylee in the past this reaction here is kind of interesting because like Obviously, they know what type of a character Azula is, but just the fact that Tylee just ha immediately knows, like, she's basically going to, like, scare me or torture me into joining her just through messing with the show. She knows that's going to happen is a interesting dynamic to uh, have going on here. But, um, yeah, I think really interesting scene with uh, the introduction of Tylee. But what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if they have been to school together for such a period of time, and, you know, even if they aren't sort of like, you know, they see, you know, sort of the bad side of Azula, like they they have a good grasp, or at least her friends here, however you consider them being her friends, um, have a good grasp on her sort of personality and the way that she sort of operates overall. So it doesn't seem like they're pretty, you know, they're they're blind to what's going to happen here. But yeah, it is an interesting, you know, a cool introduction to a new character, our Ty Lee character here, and sort of, you know, how she, you know, is at the circus and, you know, her performance and stuff like that. So it's it's definitely interesting to sort of get, you know, I guess a little bit of a, a backstory on our characters here and sort of see where they're leading towards. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have, uh, yeah, the Aang meeting with the uh, Resistance. And so we find out that uh, basically what happened, why Omashu fell, why Bumi is kind of missing, is that the day the Fire Nation arrived, Bumi, like, immediately surrendered. His uh, response on, like, what should we do was to literally say, we do nothing. And everyone is confused, baffled by this response from Bumi. And Aang really wants to know why he actually did this. But it's obvious that, like, Boomy, I guess, has been taken prisoner in all of this. And that's how the city fell. It's why there is a resistance uh, going on here. Um, and the leader is kind of like, you know, we have to fight to the last man. This is worth dying for. Aang does manage to convince them that, like, hey, in this case, it is better to live and fight another day. And probably get get out of the city because it's just fully been taken over. That this is uh, too much of a fight against the odds. You are just sort of sacrificing yourselves for kind of nothing. And so this is where Pentapox is going to be how they get the entire you know population of uh, Omashu out of the city. So um, very, very interesting scene here where even though Boomy's not around right now, you immediately get the... Yeah, this is the character from episode 5. Always with the random decisions. You have no idea what's going through his head. And he just immediately surrendered. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on this scene? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, with his personality involved, and, it, you know, it sort of might make sense that he's sort of doing this. But, you know, it's still, you know, to most of our characters here, they don't quite sort of get, you know, sort of the, the mad genius that, you know, Boomy actually is here. And they're sort of, you know, wanting to sort of really sort of understand this but you know the idea that you know there are these people they are you know trying to survive and they're trying to make their way through but you no know, they're definitely not in sort of the the right sort of situation or maybe the right sort of mindset to sort of combat sort of the forces that are you know currently you know running the city which is interesting that they're all sort of like you know not above ground like you know i guess maybe that's just because of how the city's designed or whatever that they're able to sort of you know hide away at this point in time so that's interesting in itself but yeah the, the idea that you know Aang definitely has you know sort of the way of protecting the most sort of people which is always sort of you know his goal overall um you know and just sort of this idea of them sort of working together to sort of figure out how to get out of the city here and you know this is their sort of you know sort of lead in from the earlier gag that they had mm -hmm. um 
as uh, he basically leaves kind of Sokka and Katara to set up the whole Pentapox thing because he's going to specifically look for Boomy. So along the way, he does find Flopsy, of course, the gorilla goat, uh, finds him chained up, frees him. They immediately kind of bond. And so they're looking for Boomy together. Uh, then we do cut over to kind of another one of the kind of side plots of the episode, which is that uh, Momo ends up going off on his own. He encounters Tom Tom, who's kind of wandered off from his parents. And as Momo goes to kind of run away, Tom Tom just kind of grabs Momo, kind of follows him. And it's kind of Momo and Tom Tom on the delivery shoots. And basically, Momo ends up kind of leading or bringing Tom Tom into the hands of the resistance kind of inadvertently. So a, a kind of inadvertent, mistaken kidnapping here. But it's a, it's a key part of the, the plot of the episode that... Uh, Momo encountered uh, Tom Tom in all of this. Um, uh, two pretty cool scenes. Uh, I like that they reference uh, the, the episode five with uh, Aang and Flopsy getting on quite well. Um, and the Momo stuff is always very fun when they when they give him some focus. I kind of like that Tom Tom is is also used a bit here as well. So, what are your thoughts on uh, these two? Yeah, I think it, it is good, and it's funny because we do get to see more of Tom Tom later on in a comic, but it's interesting to see him here now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the idea of using him with Momo, I think that that feels like it fits right is because of, you know, kids and sort of, you know, animals and stuff like that. So I think that's, you know, it's definitely a cute part of the episode. And it, it does actually have some meaning later on as well. So, you know, it's not all just for sort of like jokes as well. So it definitely, you know, they did a good job, I think, there of sort of balancing that sort of idea of sort of the, the fun with the seriousness of the situation that's actually going on at this point in time. Um, you know, as well as just using Flopsy and everything, like the whole joke with how, you know, Momo or how Appa normally would be written. Um, you know, I think that, you know, that goes over well here. But yeah, it's just, you know, definitely just sort of leads things all together. And you no, know, it's interesting because it is sort of like your sort of side plot here, but they do a really good job of bring it back into the fold um, as far as keeping everything together and sort of pushing the whole overall story, um, you know, together. So I think it's it's a good sort of like, side plot that really brings this off really back into the main plot pretty quickly mm -hmm. yeah the, the the comic reference is pretty fun here because it means like oh yeah tom tom like has been kidnapped twice uh once by like azula kamurakage the first time by momo uh, it's just a a funny kind of difference in scenario but um we will move on so um yeah we do get the uh scene here with uh Azula watching Ty Lee's show at the circus and so she's immediately uh asking the owner of the circus like basically oh do you, do you think she'll fall no so remove the net and he's kind of like but they they need it they like the protection um, and she's just like oh yeah you're right uh, oh re release the rest of the animals set the net on fire like do all of this stuff to make Ty Lee as uncomfortable as possible as she does her kind of uh acrobatic performance here and you can see Tylee sweating up top she makes it through the show and pretty much decides that like oh yeah the the universe is sending me messages that i need to change my career i will join you azula but um it's it's clear that she was very much kind of intimidated to uh do this it makes for an interesting scene because they don't bring it up so much like this is the interesting thing here where like Initially, uh, Tai Lee is the one who's actually like the maybe uh, least interested in joining Azula. May joins immediately, but May is the one who actually defies Azula first more than Tai Lee does. So, um, there, there's there's some interesting kind of nuance with with all of this, uh, which I, I definitely like. And you know, I'd like a little bit more backstory on these uh, three, but um, I like what we have from this. And again also some smoke and shadow backstory as well but uh what are your thoughts on uh, how azula recruits ty lee yeah yeah definitely definitely strong arm and intimidation tactics here that you know definitely gets across what she really sort of wants in the situation and you know like we mentioned earlier we we kind of already knew that ty lee had an inkling that this is what would probably sort of happen here um so, you know, it's unfortunate for Ty Lee because, you know, she could see that she really wasn't sort of super keen on this. But, you know, she sort of, you know, succumbs to the sort of situation at the moment here. And, you know, I think it, it would be interesting to see sort of what their time together when they were younger might have actually been, you know, like how that 
how that sort of dynamic would have been sort of as like, you know, younger children and stuff like that. I mean, I would suspect it would be pretty much sort of similar to what we've seen now, um, you know, up until this point in sort of the, the series here. So there is, you know, something to be thought there, but we do know how it turns out, you know, sort of later on with sort of, you know, some of the strength of characters or the strength of ideas that some of the characters have in terms of the overall sort of relationships that they have here. So it's, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what that might be sort of in the future. Mm -hmm. um, we get a quick scene where we just get the resistance receiving a letter that the governor wants to trade Tom Tom for Boomy. So that sets up the big kind of finale kind of part of this episode. Uh, we then see Azula arrives in Omashu, and yes, it turns out May is the other old friend. She will be the third team member, and she's immediately willing to just like, yep, yeah, anything to get me out of this boredom. And uh, we also get a little bit of the May Tai Lee dynamic that, of course, those two know each other as well. And I like how they do immediately clarify that those two are kind of closer than, say, like Tai Lee is with um, Azula, or May specifically is with Azula, because. May knew already that Tylee was in the circus, whereas Azula had to find out by actually, like, going there, basically finding her, that, oh, this is where you are now, mm -hmm. versus May knew enough about Tylee to know that, like, oh, I thought you found your calling when you went to the circus. So just kind of pointing out that among the trio, like, May and Tylee is actually, like, the, the closest kind of dynamic among all of them. But um, this is what's happening here. Uh, Azula kind of immediately is just like, okay, May's in charge. You know, she just steps all over Ukano and is like, May's going to be in charge of the trade. <laughs> um, you two are useless. And uh, she just immediately takes command. Um, so, yeah, what, what are your thoughts here? We get the formation of this uh, trio of characters here at last. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I guess it's sort of just par for the course that Azula just sort of takes charge in this sort of situation here as, you know, might be expected of one in her sort of, you know, I guess, position in, in the Fire Nation society here. And, you know, I guess, you know, it almost kind of makes sense that, you know, being one who might be sort of impartial to the situation, you know, might be the one that should take charge here, but it's also just her her crash sort of personality that would sort of, you know, take charge regardless of situation here. But yes, yeah, you know, seeing the three sort of reunited, I guess, here and how to interact, like you were saying there, who's closer to who is, is interesting to keep that in mind when, you know, things sort of change later on and there's sort of dynamics with each other here. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, just sort of shows the idea of, you know, how things are going in this sort of, I guess, sort of city here. You know, it looks like regardless, it looks like, you know, Tylee's a little bit sort of, you know, I guess sort of worried about the situation overall, but, you know, they have this sort of, you know, plan, this sort of, you know, trade that they're going to go through here with, you know, sort of Tom Tom sort of being in the balance here. Mm -hmm. We then uh, go basically straight to the trade. So this is where we get introduced to Boomy. He's in a kind of metal coffin to keep him from earthbending. We can see his face, but like nothing else. Um, Azula immediately is just like, eh, I actually don't think this is a fair trade because we're trading like a kid for a powerful earthbending king. And so the, the trade is called off. This causes the fight to break out. This leads to Aang sort of basically inadvertently like revealing himself as the avatar to Azula because it's her first time like encountering him. But she knows straight away that, oh, this is the avatar. And suddenly there's like a third target for this group. She specifically goes after Aang, um, and it leaves Mei and Tai Li to fight Sokka and Katara, who are also managing holding on to Tom Tom in all of this as well. So this is the kind of reveal, more or less, of the kind of fighting styles of these two characters. Again, they're both non-benders, and Mei, we got a little bit of a sense earlier on that she's sort of like a master of like throwing knives and these sort of like dart launchers. She even has them uh, attached to her legs. Um, whereas Tai Li is full uh, unarmed combat and specifically it's the introduction of chi blocking here, which of course, as we see, it works on non-benders and bender because it has the effect of like making limbs unusable and thus blocking bending as well. So uh, a bit of a scary moment for Katara here where she can't bend for a little encounters this skill for the first time but uh it is Sokka kind of uh leaving to get Appa returning that sort of turns the fight uh, uh in our kind of hero's favor here as usual Appa just like no one knows how to deal with him um 
<laughs> uh, so uh, pretty cool stuff there but uh, in terms of the action overall especially because it's on all this like crazy scaffolding so it's it's a very dynamic fight but uh, what are your thoughts on the trade and the start of the fight here? yeah it definitely is pretty dynamic because there's you know a lot of like a sort of verticality that you can see here in terms of you know um you no know, boomy being sort of hoisted down and then lifted back up and you know that sort of starts things really sort of moving along here so i think it's it's pretty interesting how they're sort of you know using this to sort of show off the skills you know show tai lee sort of with sort of her skills my with her sort of skills that we have here and you know how they're sort of trying to combat it here um in the first time here so now I, I think it's a good showing for you know our ozai angels and sort of what they can really do in this you know sort of situation mm -hmm. Azula, of course, chases Aang. This also happens on the delivery system here. Uh, Aang is basically riding Boomy's coffin down the system as Azula uses the various carts and stuff like that. And we just see how aggressive and powerful she is as she's constantly sending attacks at Aang. He's barely dodging them. Uh, they get to a kind of rough situation where it seems like Azula's big pinwheel attack is going to kind of smash into them. And Boomy reveals that he can earthbend quite powerfully with just his face, like just moving his neck a little bit, bending with his chin, and he nearly completely takes Azula out here, but it forces her to kind of give up the chase to sort of save herself. And uh, yeah, he just <laughs> reveals he has pretty full control over earthbending, uh, even with just his face, as he manages to bring himself to a stop, standing up, uh, and starts to finally talk to Aang about like, hey, yeah, this is kind of why I, I did all of this. Um, so uh, <laughs> this is this is pretty interesting. Like Aang is just like, Boomy, what did you do? Now he explains about Jing's at this point. So he brings up that, uh, okay, there are there's positive uh, Jing attacking, negative Jing when you're defending. Um, but then he introduces a third type while also mentioning that there are actually 82 other types, so 85 in total. Um, but neutral Jing is what he wants to teach Ang about here. And this is where you do nothing slash wait for the right moment to strike. And it's not Boomy's right moment to fight back yet. And that's why Boomy can't be Ang's earthbending teacher, at least right now. Uh, so he's going to have to leave, find someone else, and Boomy gives him the advice that your teacher needs to be a master of neutral Jing, someone who will wait and listen before attacking. And that's kind of the uh, words of wisdom. Boomy's not going to be the teacher. It will be someone else. But someone else who has uh, the kind of similar approach of Boomy, because uh, Boomy's also a master of neutral Jing, as we will see. Uh, and, and this is mm -hmm. it's quite the payoff on this. That, like, we have to wait until... Basically, it's the invasion, but like we don't find out about like what Boomy specifically did until the finale. So um, uh, we're waiting quite a while on the reveal of like what Boomy's right moment actually is. But um, I, I think it works out really, really well. Where he takes back the city on his own, saves everyone from having to fight a lot. Um, so it, it works, uh, certainly. And you kind of wonder like, mm, Mr. Chant... Should he have maybe attempted to teach Aang here? But, um, you know, we have to have the introduction of Toph, of course, um, even though Boomy teaching Aang could have been interesting by itself. But um, what are your thoughts on this? The the Azula part of the action scene and then finally the conversation with Boomy. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the whole, I guess, sort of Azula sort of chase scene with Aang and Boomy here. I think, you know, it's just more, you know, showing how dynamic the show can be, you know, sort of the chase scenes here, which are always sort of, like we've mentioned before, are, are usually pretty good here. And there's a lot of sort of back and forth of Aang, you know, sort of really sort of, you know, has to deal with a firebender on sort of like a, a different level than what he's, you know, sort of been experiencing up until this point here. Because, you know, Zula's really not, at least, you know, other than maybe say like sort of lightning bending, um, you know, holding back in sort of her attacks here. And Aang's just sort of barely able to sort of fend things off and, you know, doesn't really sort of get the upper hand. It's really sort of Boomy who, despite being in this coffin, like you're saying, has, you know, incredible ability with his sort of bending here, which, you know, really just makes you sort of wonder sort of, you know, you know how he has this sort of, like, control, especially when, you know, he does sort of finally set himself back up to where he sort of started at. Um, that almost seems like 
unreal the way that he has that sort of uh, ability here. But no, I, I like the sort of conversation that they have here, how, you know, he's, even if he's not sort of directly teaching Aang, you know, sort of earthbending, he's still, you know, imparting his own sort of wisdom and sort of the techniques here that, you know, he later on sort of incorporates um, into his own sort of, you know, abilities and stuff like that. So I think, you know, it's a good teaching moment for Aang, even if it isn't quite the moment that he really wants to sort of happen with Boomy here. But, you know, it definitely all does sort of turn out well in the end, um, even if they're not sort of aware of it at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it is funny that, like, yeah, Boomy get, gets this amazing reveal. He can earthbend with his face, uh, pretty much any anything. And then you go back to Great Divide and the Canyon Guide's like, my arms are broken. I can't earthbend at all. And it's like, legs? No. No. Okay. <laughs> like, that. just that guy is, like, useless without his arms. It, 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 it's meant to kind of obviously highlight the, the difference between a skilled earthbender and then one of the best in the entire world and I, th I think they're pretty consistent with this where like the masters do have kind of like feats of bending like this where they're able to do a lot with very little that uh boomy is like uh, has like haru level bending with just his face like that that's the the difference between kind of some of these characters and um, so that's a, a a very kind of fun comparison uh, final scenes here are that uh, Azula with the team, they've obviously kind of haven't quite got it done here, but obviously they, they don't lose Omashu here is, is the kind of key thing. It's still under Fire Nation control, but they just haven't captured Aang. But again, Azula didn't, it wasn't part of her plan um, going into this to capture Aang. Um, but we get the idea that uh, there's now, uh, they are now planning to track Aang as well as Iroh and uh, Zuko. And we do get a little moment here where Ty Lee teases May about, you know, ooh, like, you must be excited to uh, meet up with Zuko again. And May kind of has a bit of a blush moment, so immediately highlight likes Zuko, of course. So, fun stuff there. And then the final scene of the episode is Aang kind of, uh, kind of sneaks up uh, into where the governor is and basically uh, drops Tom Tom back parents. Um, so nice moment there to end the kind of drama of the episode here. Tom Tom doesn't stay captured, he is given back. And it's just a nice little moment, uh, very fitting for Aang kind of across the entire episode. He helped the resistance by not kind of fighting to the death, by giving them a different option, and now he's also given Tom Tom back here. Um, very consistent with Aang like across the episode, like wanting to save Boomy and then those two bits as well. Um, so pretty good ending for me. Um, but what are your thoughts on these final couple of... Yeah, I think it's a good job of sort of just setting up things to come. Like, you know, that idea that, you know, they're still going after, you know, Aang as a, a new target as well as Zuko and Iroh. And there's apparently a, a relationship there that we are sort of going to sort of find out a little bit more. And, you know, and Aang, yeah. Like, I mean, Aang's just sort of, you know, even in sort of the, the worst of situations, he's generally trying to do right by the people, even if, you know, he doesn't quite agree with what they're sort of doing in the city and stuff like that. But, you know, it seems like everything sort of turned out for the best. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is a Return to Omashu. So next time on the rewatch we are going to be doing another, another three episodes so on the avatar side of things we'll do 204 the swamp uh, which will be very interestingly uh, paired up with uh, two Korra episodes uh, beginnings part one and beginnings part two of two spiritual episodes um one very into like the details and then one more with some uh, really strong advice and like enlightenment and the banyan tree and stuff like that so should be a, a pretty interesting the swamp is always one of those episodes it feels underappreciated but then when i think you see people focus in on it they're all like yeah this is a pretty good episode excited for the swamp and of course beginnings is is, is fantastic as ever but uh, what are your thoughts on that next batch of three episodes yeah no i mean beginnings is always a good one that one i think those those parts you know stand out on their own just in terms of you know the style and in terms of the the message that they have and just you know how you know cohesive they feel so i think those ones you know I don't think many people have too many issues with them other than maybe where they're, you know, the season overall, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, and then the swamp, I think, you know, that one's, it's always interesting. It's, it's in the swamp, I think, you know, sometimes it might get sort of, you know, mis, 
thought of because there's sort of a, a newer type of bending technique or a different type of bending technique in it, but it also has, you know, a lot of deeper meaning to it as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that will be next time out podcast. Um, so, yeah, like, like I said, like there's, there should be a few little bits of pieces of news. Kind of preview chapter for Yang Chen. Hopefully we'll, we'll come out at some point. The first look at Netflix <laughs> and uh, Avatar. So it will probably will still be the case, though, that the next podcast, I think, is the, is the rewatch. And then the month after that, we are probably into uh, Yang Chen itself. So, going to be a pretty exciting once uh, Yang Chen book two but that has been episode 260 of the Avatar Online podcast it's been myself and Greg thanks for listening and bye bye